So, uh, okay, now you're recording this thing. Uh -huh. Yes, now we're Good. recording. Welcome, Gyo. Thank you. <laughs> Should I just go ahead or what? Hello? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Good, good, good. So thank you for, for the invitation. Um, uh, I will tell you about uh, some recent work we've been doing here in Aarhus in this uh, Center for Complex uh, Quantum Systems. And uh, this also relates to polarons, which is the overall topic of the conference. Uh, and it's magnetic polarons. So it's maybe in a, in a system that hasn't been discussed so much so far at least not within this conference, uh, but let me try and, and, and illustrate for you, or outline for you what this is about. Whoops, why doesn't it work? Okay, so uh, the structure of the first part of the talk uh, would be the following. So first I will tell you, remind you about the fermi hubbard model, uh, and then how you go from the fermi hubbard model to the TJ model, uh, close to half filling. And why, the t and, and, and uh, essentially what the TJ model does is it describes holes moving around in an antiferromagnetic background. And I'll try and wave my hands and, and appeal to, you know, that this is finally something where uh, cold atoms can actually say something about uh, the phase diagram of how TCs. We've been saying this for decades, but it's only now in some sense that we are now starting to study models that are close to what they have in these uh, cuprates. Uh, then I will, uh, Talk about, uh, you know, explain to you that this motion of holes in an antiferromagnetic background gives rise to a polaron, just like a motion of uh, mobile impurities in Fermi gases gives rise to Fermi polaron or BECs to Bose polaron. Here it's the magnetic polaron because it sheds off uh, magnetic waves, uh, just like it sheds off Coulomb modes in the BEC. I'll tell you about that, uh, and I'll also tell you. Uh, a very nice theory to describe that, which has turned out to be accurate, uh, also for strong coupling. This is not developed by us. Uh, this is developed back in the high TC community 10, 20 years ago. So we have just adopted that to, to the problem at hand. And what we've done is we have taken that method as a, as, as a starting point, And then we have developed uh, a non-perturbative scheme to calculate the corresponding wave function from that uh, diagrammatic calculation. And with that wave function, we can calculate all sorts of things that haven't been uh, possible to calculate before, such as the structure of the dressing cloud around the polaron, and also actually time-dependent dynamics this is something we're doing right now. Uh, so these are very recent results basically just given to me last week. So, so you'll hear the latest news from Aarhus concerning that problem. So let's go ahead uh, and uh, remind ourselves what, what these doped antiferromagnets are about. So the fermi hubbard model is, is, I don't know where, can you see my cursor, by the way? Yeah. Yeah, so here's the fermi hubbard model. So this is like a canonical model for, for, for strongly correlated systems. Uh, and it's, despite its simplicity, it's, it's, uh, it's as we know, it's, it's not easy to, to analyze in general. Uh, there are some interesting, or some, not made some easy limits. Uh, so one easy limit is if you take strong repulsion, uh, much stronger than the hopping and uh, at half filling, it reduces to the Heisenberg model uh, and it's, it forms an antiferromagnet. This is a textbook stuff. So here's an antiferromagnet. You see these drawings many times. Uh, spin up and spin down atoms, spin up blue, spin down red. And the spins are now in terms of this swinger representation of the uh, fermion operators here. These are the Pauli matrices and J is the usual force T squared over U. So this is an easy limit, but then uh, you could ask yourself what happens when you go away from half filling uh, when you start putting in holes. And this is precisely uh, what uh, happens in high TC materials. So here's my link to higher temperature superconductivity. So, uh, you know, when you, when you induce, introduce hole doping, uh, you go away from the antiferron. Here's the phase diagram as a function of doping. Uh, when you introduce doping, you kill the antiferromagnetic order and you get all these crazy phases. And, uh, whoops, what's going on here? Um, so when you have uh, small doping, uh, you can also do some tricks. You can go a little bit beyond the Heisenberg model. So what you can do is then you can derive a, a model that's simpler than the Hubbard model, which is called, but still it's pretty difficult to solve. It's called the TJ model. And what the TJ model does uh, is that here you have your Heisenberg model. Here's uh, your, your magnetic ordering here. 
But then you now have hole hopping around. This is the first term here. So you start having hole hopping in your term in addition to your uh, magnetic order. So you have now two terms that compete with each other. And here's a little cartoon, so let me illustrate how that works. So here's a hole, you can see this green uh, hole here in the middle. So here I've removed an atom. And when that hole moves around, and there you have to spin up and spin down atoms surrounding it. But then when the hole, whoops, when the hole starts to move, you see it starts to create frustration. They want to be anti-ferromagnetic, but now you have a lot of ferromagnetic neighboring sites here that cost energy. So it actually costs energy for the holes to hop. It creates more and more uh, magnetic frustration in the system. So in general, the hole hopping and the magnetic order uh, compete with each other. Uh, and it's this competition is actually not easy to, to, to understand in general, but what it does is it leads to the formation of uh, polarons, just like uh, the motion of, of, of uh, you know, um, a mobile impurity in a BEC sheds off spin waves, Bouguer uh, mode sheds off spin waves, uh, the hold. Uh, so it leads to the formation of the polaron. And there was a lot of attention uh, on that thing. So if you look up magnetic polarons in the TJ model, you will find an immense amount of literature. Because as I said before, in the high seek super uh, community, uh, people said, okay, let, let's try and understand at least the limit of small doping. If we can understand that, then we might get some, some, some hints on what, what goes on at larger doping where you have this D-wave <coughs> superconducting phase. Um, and then it sort of died out. There's been a number of, uh, of theories, string models and, and, and so on, uh, Monte Carlo calculations, variational calculations, lots and lots and lots of stuff. And it died out in the beginning of the 2000s, but then it has received a revival now because uh, now you can actually create uh, these, uh, this TJ model. You can realize it, at least you could realize the Hubbard model very well in essentially perfectly in cold atoms as we know. So there are now these optical lattice experiments where they can make, put fermions in and they've seen the anti-ferromagnetic order and then they can punch holes. So here's a picture from the Kiner group at Harvard. So you see a lattice here, they're now also getting fairly big and you see a hole in the middle and they can take pictures of these holes. They can see, they can look at how they hop around and they can also look at the magnetization around holes. So now you can start exploring the structures of the uh, magnetic polarons microscopically. So you can simply take pictures of them. So now you can start Reinvestigate this problem. See, it's, it's something we don't understand that we can learn, that we can now understand with using quantum simulation. Uh, let me highlight two experiments. I mean, there are many nice, but I, I'll, I will uh, return to. And one experiment is that they measure the magnetic correlations around the hole. How does the uh, hole create magnetic frustrations? And the other experiment, which is more recent, is from the Kiner group, which is the one I'll spend by far the most time on, is where they actually measure the hole dynamics. So they take pictures of the hole hopping around. And then they see how the hole moves away from its origin. They make a quench, they punch a hole here, and then they see it hover around. And so then they see these different dynamical phases. Um, so this uh, motivated us to go back to this problem. Uh, so this is what we did. And we were looking around the literature and then also be, partly because of our own background, the most natural thing was to think because it's so analogous to what we've done already with, with polar on physics, is to think in terms of how does this hole uh, create spin waves that presses it. That's so obvious if you've been working on the previous fermion problems, a polar on problems. So this is what we did. So we, our attention focused on what's called the self-consistent Born approximation. And this also turns out, at least as far as we can see, to be one of the most po powerful uh, frameworks to study this problem. So here I've written down the TJ model again. So you see you have a hopping term here and you have the magnetic term here and they compete with each other. Hopping kills magnetic order. Um, and then, uh, okay, so we can write it into a uh, form that looks even more familiar, very familiar actually for us uh, from the coalescent community by using a Holstein Primakov uh, rotation or representation of these uh, spin operators and, and Fermi operators in terms of, it's also called the slave fermion uh, representation. Uh, and what basically what you do is you split, you, you create, you express your Fermi operators in terms of spin degree of free, uh, magnetic uh, spin degree of freedom and a whole degree of freedom. So you see, you now have two, whoops, you have two uh, operators entering. You have a whole operator H here and you have a B operator here, which is a spin wave. And when you do this transformation, what pops out uh, when you transform this uh, Hamiltonian into this uh, form here, 
what pops out is the usual spin wave spectrum. This would just be the Heisenberg spin wave spectrum here. So these are anti magnetic spin waves and their energy scales with J clearly because this, they're give, given by diagonalizing this thing here. But then you have this funny term here, which uh, the first term, which describes hopping of spin waves. And here you very explicitly see how the hopping, uh, so, so now it's at the level of mathematics, not just the cartoon. You can see how the hopping of the hole, this describes a hole coming in with a given momentum, crystal momentum, and then coming out with another crystal momentum, it sheds off a spin wave. Or it can also, of course, absorb a spin wave, but you can see how that starts to create spin waves in the system, which cost energy. And if you and the, and that uh, vertex here, this shedding off a of spin waves here scales with t because hopping scales with t. So one thing you should remember is that the coupling strength of this system is j over t. So uh, so if j over oh, it's the inverse of that. So if j over t is very small, if there's a lot of hopping, then the problem becomes strongly coupled. The hopping kills the magnetic order. If t is 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 uh, very small then you almost go back to the Heisenberg model, which you can solve. So strong coupling means J over T small. Good, so then uh, let's just uh, uh, outline this self-consistent Born approximation. So now you have the Hamiltonian, you can start playing with- uh, uh, Gil, uh, sorry, uh, yeah? so far you are not specific about dimensionality. Formally, you can write everything in 2D and 3D at least equally. Yes. Yes. I'm not sure about all method in 1D. Probably there are some flaws which just kill it, right? In this diagrammatic expansion. Yes. Uh, I think it probably works even better in 3D. I'm not sure about in 1D, but in, in, in so, so at, at the moment it's, it's, it's quite general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, so we so this method that was developed by Schmidt Brink and others, uh, Charlie Kane and, and Patrick Lee, is, is the paper we followed. Basically, corresponds to uh, summing a certain class of uh, you know you do approximation, you sum a certain class of diagrams, uh, and physically what it corresponds to is that you annihilate the spin waves in the same order as you create them, or the hole moves around, and then when you make closed paths, it retraces its path back. Um, and that uh, approximation, when compared to Monte Carlo, turns out to work well for strong coupling. So we implemented this method. Uh, and here's a typical uh, plot of the whole spectral function. So this is what this method spits out. Um, so here's the spectral function. So this for given coupling strength, J or T, and for a given whole momentum. Uh, you see a typical quasi-particle peak, which you now would call the magnetic polaron, and then you see some stuff up here at high energy. Some people claim that these are excited states. Actually, we don't know. Uh, There's something we should look into these other bumps here, but let's focus on the spectral peak here. There's the, uh, the quasi-particle. Of course, it has a residue, and if you plot the residue as a function of coupling strength, it goes down, and actually it can become quite small for, for strong coupling. And you can get the dispersion uh, of these holes in the magnetic, not in the magnetic, in the full Brion zone. This is a full Brion zone of the lattice. And maybe what is a little bit unusual for us is that the minima, the ground states are not at zero momentum, but at momentum plus minus pi halves. So that you have these ground states here, uh, which are degenerate. And this is also something that comes out, not just of this approximation, but also Monte Carlo and other calculations. Uh, one should recall that in the original slave boser fermion Hamiltonian, there is no kinetic energy of the holes. So uh, a priori, there's no nothing that should pick p equals zero. But it's a little bit unusual, but that's, that's what comes out. Um, okay, but all these features, is, which are the, the obvious thing that one would calculate if you're used to other Polaron uh, theory paper, uh, experiments uh, in cold atoms, like the energy, the residue, and so on, are actually not so easy to measure for these guys in, in the optical lattice experiments. They take pictures. So here's a picture again. So they take pictures of the hole hopping around. They don't really measure its energy and they don't measure its residue. Uh, so, so we need to, to work a little bit harder. So this would have been almost too easy. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to look at 
the magnetic structure of the of the of the polar one, the, the structure of its dressing cloud. So it creates these spin waves around it, and we have to calculate those. And and that is something where you the easiest way to do that is just to have the wave function. So we need the polar one wave function. And again, this is uh, something that should be very familiar to many of you. Uh, the concepts that come come out are, are very similar. So basically, here is here we've written down an expression for the uh, polar on wave function. So you have your antiferromagnetic order over here, and then you can expand the polar on wave function in the number of spin waves that the hole has created. So here, here's a residue times a bare hole with no spin waves, just acting on the ferromagnet, antiferromagnet, and then then here's the first term with one spin wave created. So you see here, you create a spin wave with this operator B and the hole has a different momentum to conserve momentum and so on. So this is an infinite series, uh, of course. And here is diagrammatically. Okay, so the, the, the nice thing about this self-consistent Born approximation is that you can develop a diagrammatic language uh, for this uh, wave function in the sense that there are, recursive, there are recursion relations between these coefficients. So you can develop, you can scratch your head and this is what this guy Reiser did and figure out what wave function corresponds to this self-consistent Born approximation. And then you get a closed expression for all coefficients to infinite order. They're given by this recursion formula, which has to do with the Green's function times the vertex that, spin, that, that sheds off uh, spin waves. So this uh, has been done. Um, so with this wave function, you can now ask yourself, whoa, let's then, the, since we have the wave function, then we can calculate the magnetization around the hole. So let's ask the following problem. Uh, so if you have the hole sitting in the middle there and with a given momentum, and then you go at a distance d, what is the magnetization and the distance d? How much is, is it, uh, does it deviate from its equilibrium value without any holes around? And the operator that formalizes this is basically you say, let me hold b at r. This is what this operator does here. And then let me measure the magnetization at r plus d. And this is just normalization. So this is the object that we have to calculate. And this is something that they can measure because they can take pictures of the atoms and they can take pictures of, given the hole is there, what is the magnetization around the hole? So this is a correlation function we set out to calculate. Uh, and the structure that comes out from such a calculation, if you just look at the numerator, is that you're counting the holes. So the holes, you have a hole counting operator and then if you want to know what a set is, the magnetization is, you have to know how many spin waves there are. So uh, loosely speaking, you get a, this kind of expectation value of a whole operator and a, and a spin wave counting operator. And uh, you can then um, plug in the wave function, this, this wave function that corresponds to the, to the uh, self-consistent board approximation. And you get, then you could just basically do big contractions or whatever you want. This is basically what these uh, wavy lines correspond to. So the wavy lines is how you pair up the spin operator uh, with each other. So it, you get higher and higher orders, you get more and more spin waves uh, for according to how many terms you include in your wave function of spin waves. And then you also, the lines correspond to hole counting. So you have a whole annihilation and creation operator. So when you sit down and think about what structure do you get out when you have to calculate this expectation value, you get terms with increasing number of spin waves. You actually get more terms than this. Uh, you also get terms where spin waves cross, uh, but those are not included in the self-consistent Born approximation. If you want to uh, do a calculation which is consistent with the self-consistent Born approximation, you throw away terms where you cross the spin waves. So this is the structure that comes out. And this was also known actually by these guys here. So they went to third order uh, in the, so they calculate the structure around the polar on to third order. A in, in question? Here. Yeah. So um, what is the interaction between these polarons? I mean, is it attractive or repulsive? Uh, between two polarons? Yeah. That's an extremely good question. That's what we're working on right now. It's attractive. So, but so, if it's so attractive, the, uh, isn't this going to be unstable? Uh, like towards find... con condensation of polarons? Uh, mm, no, 
because the holes are uh, exclude each other. You can only have one hole at a given site. So they're fermionic. I so mean, that's uh, actually, I mean, now I'm giving away, but, but we're actually looking right now at the pairing of these holes, of course. Uh, sorry, but this is not what, huh? I, I didn't understand. I mean, holes are fermionic. Why? I mean, this precludes uh, superconductivity. <clears throat> it doesn't. It doesn't. So you get pairing, but the lowest order is, is, is not S-wave. So they don't, they don't collapse. I mean, they, they well, at least, um, maybe I have to be careful here. So, so here we're looking at one hole which is, uh, there are not two holes. At the moment, we are working hard on looking at two holes and looking for bound states uh, of two holes. Whether they, and here, of course, the, the question is, do they form D-wave pairs? But in the beginning, you showed the phase diagram. And so you, you are working where? I mean, in which phase? Now I'm just working with one hole. So I am working in the extreme limit of just uh, oh, so like this phase diagram. Zero yeah. doping. So I'm taking, yes, so I'm here. I just want to look at the properties of one hole, which is basically what you also see in this experiment here. But you're absolutely right that two holes, they've actually, they're, they're, they're looking for correlations between two holes. So they, 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 that's of course what they want. They want, because if you can understand how these two holes pair up, then, you, and in particular, if, they, if you get D-wave symmetry of these pairs, you are on, on track of, or, you know, trying to, to that starts to smell of superconductivity because they are, they are charge carriers. And that's what we're looking at now. I see, okay, thank you. I didn't realize you were working at zero doping. Just, 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 just zero doping, yes. Uh, now I lost my track of where I am. Uh, yes, so, so if you want to calculate the magnetization just of a single hole now to understand the present experiments in, the, in, the, uh, in these optical uh, lattices, these quantum simulation experiments, but they see no correlations. They either have one hole, they have two holes, and they see no correlations, or three or four, but they don't really see any correlations. My uh, yeah. yeah okay, sorry. Uh, I just I was just curious. Like, like what you're calculating here is, is kind of like say for the ground state, or uh, right? So like it's uh, it's for a specific wave way function where you calculate correlations, but then in the experiment yes. you pin down uh, like say or like you. Um, how do you actually relate what you uh, observe here to the experiment where um, it, it's not, it, it's in a way, it's, it's not really um, a correlation in the same way that you have from the wave function? You, you are a very good question. Again, you are, you're both of you are, are, are jumping ahead. So you, you're absolutely right that they are not in the ground state in the experiment. So they do this, they punch a hole and then they see it evolve. And that's, that will be the second half of the talk. Okay, thank you. But that's a harder problem. That's a, di that's a dynamical problem, right? So that's, a, that's harder. Uh, yeah, but when you have a good PhD student, you can do it. So, so, so let's, uh, let's, let's wait a little bit with that. Uh, so, but let's take this, the, 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 let's assume that the, the Polaron is in a given eigenstate and then just calculate the magnetization around it. And the Sorry. structure that comes, May I ask also a question uh, just before you go, you go on? Uh, what is the, what controls this self-consistent approximation? What is the small parameter? What, in what limit can you neglect all these crossing diagrams? There is no small parameter to strong coupling. And, and at least not as I understand. I mean, there are some physical motivations why, uh, like if you take the easing model, uh, you can, you can, this, this, what you can convince yourself is that the most important excitations are these string-like excitations where the hole moves out and then retraces its path back because that's the only way it can uh, annihilate the disorder it has created. You can, it can also do it in other ways. It can retrace, it, it can go around twice and things like this, but the most important things are it goes out and then back. And this is, in some sense, what this approximation does. Um, of course, we are not in the easy model. So if you create a spring, string of disorder, then you have terms in the, in the Heisenberg Hamiltonian that can repair that disorder. So, but, so 
as far as, as I'm aware, it's physically motivated by those kinds of considerations, but there is no expansion parameter for strong coupling. Hello? Yes, thank you. Okay, so, so, uh, so people calculate the magnetization uh, going to third order and what this, then this Christian Knagago, who is a PhD student here now postdoc, uh, not for much longer, unfortunately, he actually uh, was able to write down some Dyson-like equations to calculate these, this expectation value. So he was able to go to infinite order. So not only can you do the wave function to infinite order, but you can also calculate expectation values of this kind of the, of the magnetic structure around the hole to infinite order. And this is nice because then we can go to the strong coupling regime, which uh, empirically is where this self-consistent Born approximation works well, even though there is no formal expansion parameter, but it has turned out to work pretty well there when you compare with Monte Carlo. And it's also uh, nice to be able to go to infinite order because the Hubbard, to get the T-day model from the Hubbard model, you assume that U is much larger than T. So inherently T is much smaller than, larger than J. So you are in the strong coupling regime if you want to uh, start the T-J model from the Hubbard model, which is what they do in the cold atoms. So this is, uh, so this is uh, what Christian did. So we're very happy about that. And let's just see what, what this approximation now spits out. Mm -hmm. So here is a plot where you have uh, the hole in the middle here. It's sitting at position 0, 0.0. This is now a two-dimensional problem. So now we're looking at the two-dimensional square lattice. And let's put the polar one in its ground state. So pi half, pi half. And let's take a given coupling strength. So J is a half T, so relatively strong coupling. And what you see the color code here is how much the magnetic order is distorted, actually reduced away from perfect antiferromagnetic order. So perfect antiferromagnetic order is white. And the more color it gets, the more disturbed it is. And then this increased the, uh, the coupling strength by making J smaller, so it's easier to create spin waves. And you see that this, the, the magnetic Dressing cloud, this is a calculation on a 16 by 16 or 32 by 32, if I get. So we can calculate this, this property. We can really look at the structure of the uh, magnetic polaron, the dressing cloud around it. And what we get is not surprisingly that the, that the size of the dressing cloud increases with coupling. And it can even, it's, 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 uh, it's quantified here. So here you see the size of the magnetization away from its unperturbed limit one, if there was no hole. In the nearest neighbor is the red one, you see it goes down and then it even flips sign. So does the next nearest neighbor and so you see these guys here can even be, have a higher order than if there was no hole, which is due to constructive interference between the spin waves. And then you also typically get this elongated shape along the hole momentum. So let's look a little bit closer at the shape of this dressing cloud. Uh, so here I've, I've plotted the Brion zone again, and this uh, 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 square in the middle is tilted square is the magnetic Brion zone. So this is the Brion zone of the full lattice, is this one here. And then the, the antiferromagnetic lattice, of course, has a smaller Brion zone because the unit cell of the antiferromagnet is larger than, than uh, twice as large as, the, as for, the, for the lattice, underlying lattice. So the Brion zone is half as big and here it is. So it's inside here. Okay, so let's now look at the magnetization around a hole. So here's the hole again. And here you see the color code uh, quantifies how much the magnetization is distorted away from, from a perfect antiferromagnetic order. Um, and here I've picked the momentum. So coupling some 0.3 J or T, so it's relatively strong coupling. And I've picked the momentum at the ground state, pi half, pi half. Here's the shape of the dressing cloud. That's, uh, and then you notice that it actually has some symmetries. So it has two symmetries. It has uh, mirror symmetries along this diagonal, which is not surprising because the momentum points in this direction. Uh, but it also has uh, mirror symmetry along, uh, uh, along this direction here, which is not so obvious. Let's take another momentum. So let's go along the magnetic beyond zone. So now we take this momentum here. So we turn the momentum a little bit and we look at the dressing cloud. We can do it again. And what you see is it's, it's surprisingly symmetric still. So it still has mirror symmetries around uh, these two diagonals, which is not at all obvious if you look at uh, the direction of the momentum. Let's go down to this corner here. 
and you see you get a highly symmetric uh, dressing cloud. Actually, it has the full symmetry of the AF lattice, antiferromagnetic lattice. So it has a full symmetry group of the antiferromagnetic lattice, which is it just came out of numerics. So we were a little bit surprised of that. If you go away from the, the magnetic Brion zone into the uh, Brion zone, then you see it loses some of its symmetry. It still has these two mirror symmetries here, but it loses it along the diagonals. And if you take a general momentum here, which is not uh, in any particular place in the Brion zone, here's how the dressing cloud looks, but it still is inversion symmetric. So R and minus R are still symmetric around the, the hole. And these symmetries are actually surprisingly high. Uh, and so we were scratching our heads a little bit and thinking, oh, where do they come from? And, and uh, if you look at one symmetry, that is the inversion symmetry, which holds for all momenta inside the Brion zone, the, the dressing cloud is inversion symmetric. That comes from time reversal symmetry. So that if you can actually show that it comes from time reversal symmetry, and that's actually at least not so also obvious because you could imagine that if the polaron is moving in some along some direction, crystal momentum, maybe the dressing cloud looks like this. It doesn't have to be symmetric, inversion symmetric, but it is. But this you can convince yourself from time reversal symmetry. So it's actually symmetric. Uh, and you can also convince yourself that uh, the lattice symmetries of the AF order, the antiferromagnetic order, you can use those to show that these mirror symmetries along the diagonals uh, hold when you're on the edge of the magnetic beyond zone. So in particular, if you're in the ground state, it's highly symmetric, the pressing cloud. So we think this could be fun to look at. And, and funnily enough, the experiments uh, have not looked at the magnetization. They've looked at much more hairy correlation functions, but the magnetization itself around the whole, they have not really analyzed in detail, but we think it could be fun to look for this, these kind of symmetries. These are, by the way, independent of the self-consistent Born approximation. They're quite general. So this could be fun, uh, interesting to look at, we think. Now, so back to Artem's question. So what they do is, for instance, in this experiment here, uh, this is from, it's very recent experiment from the Kainer group. They don't look at brown states. Uh, by the way, the temperature is also not negligible. So even if they could equilibrate the thing, it would be in, in, at temperature, but that's a different problem. Um, they, they, they do non-equilibrium dynamics. So they punch a hole. So in this experiment, basically what they did, you see a picture here, they punch a hole in the middle and then they watch how that thing evolves in fairly large lattice now. So they also punch four holes because they're so far away from each other, they don't, they don't really interfere. But the essence is that they look at dynamics and not ground states as Artem uh, pointed out in this question. And what they can do, they can do many things, uh, but what they do, uh, one of the things they do is they look at how does the hole propagate away from its original position at time equals zero. It starts to, to, to diffuse uh, in this lattice, it starts to hop. So they can basically measure the distance, the average. So since they can take pictures, they can get, they know where the hole is on average. Of course, it's, it's symmetric uh, when it evolves out, but the hole will start to diffuse out. So the Average distance it is away from its uh, origin at t equals zero will grow in time. And this is what you see here. So these points here, um, uh, how far away the hole is from its origin as a function of time for two different uh, coupling strengths, these experimental points here. And, and uh, the Greiner group, they threw two uh, theories. They threw many theories at it, uh, but that I hear that are shown two theories. Uh, there's some, Initially, you see that the diffusion follows just basically quantum warp of a free particle. Just put a free particle at, at position zero and then let it evolve in time freely, no interactions. This is what this dash line gives you, quantum walk. And that actually recovers the initial dynamics quite well, but it totally fails for longer time dynamics. These are fits, these lines here. But the other line here is some weird uh, quantum walk on a beta lattice. Uh, sorry, that's this line here, uh, which I don't really understand, but there's no, there are no interactions in this model, but they, I think they tried to um, model friction by picking, by, by modeling with as a quantum walk in some other lattice. But the underlying lattice is square, as you can see in these pictures here. So this effect, this deviation away from uh, quantum walk is due to interactions. So you see this slower long time dynamics. 
So uh, to do that, uh, you, don't, you don't want the ground state. You actually want the time-dependent version of the surface system born approximation. You want a time-dependent wave function, which initially has a whole, okay, at p equals zero, but you can fully transform it to get it at i equals zero. If you can do it in momentum space, you can also do it in real space. And that's what we did. Um, so what you have to do is you have to figure out as this hole travels around, you put it in a given position as it travels around, it, it spins off these uh, waves, creates magnetic frustration. Uh, and this is of course driven by this term in the Hamiltonian. So when you start in a given momentum state, then uh, it can shed off spin waves. Yeah. So uh, what happens is even though your initial wave function is the hole in a given momentum state, you start getting time dependent coefficients in this expansion again for, uh, for instance, Mira and Jesper, this should be ex extremely familiar. I mean, it's 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 just uh, a spin. It, it's it's a it's a wave function where you add more and more spin waves, but the coefficients are now uh, time dependent. So now we need to solve this time dependent equation with with this Hamiltonian here, and again, Christian uh, actually managed with surprised me. I just said, look at this problem. And then he comes back uh, a month later and then he has actually solved it to infinite order. So these recursion relations that uh, occur for the ground state actually carry over into uh, the, the dynamic problem. Uh, again, you have to throw away terms. So uh, uh, to... Uh, yo, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, but you, you terminate this uh, expansion last, last line on this uh, C1, C2. Uh, or, or there's solve... a dot here. Yeah, dots here. And, and the, it's, he solved for every CN. Yes. Oh. Yes, it's, it's quite, but it's, it's not exact. It's not an exact solution. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, a solution within this self-consistent born where you, where you say that the dynamics, um, you throw away terms in the dynamics. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you, if, you, if you take the same uh, terms that, that in the spirit of the self-consistent born approximation, the one, an approximation which will reduce to the self-consistent born approximation for the eigenproblem, then he solved it to infinite order. Uh, would you go to, if you would go to, to, to the ground state analysis for, for this variational wave function, uh, what, would be also the, what would be the approximation? So like there, there is no dynamics, formally at least. Or you, or you, then, or it's you... just a, then you just get a phase vector oscillating. Then it's just the eigenstate with the, it oscillates with the eigen uh, energy times uh, t, e to the it, and then the, the coefficients are constant. Uh. But here, uh, it's not, you're not in these experiments, as Artem pointed out in his question, you don't, you don't, you don't go into the eigenstate, you punch a hole. And this has, uh, of course, a projection on all states. And what Christian has done is he basically just says, okay, uh, he has evolved an initial state uh, from this initial state, he evolves but it I, according I, to I, this. Sorry if I take your time, but I still probably very naive and correct me here, people, if I say nonsense. But even if you, you said that in principle uh, for the ground state, this is a wave function. Okay, fine. But we, we don't know this wave function. In, in practice, if you want to write it, uh, you, you also have to kind of uh, solve this uh, set of variational equations, right? Because you, you have interacting problem. You have, a, say, one hole approximation. Uh, you have a, whatever. You have a non wave function interacting model. Mm -hmm. And you have to find coefficients, this explicitly, if you want to write it down. So, so you are saying that if you would be able to write this and that in a full fledged form, you would have the wave function. Yes, but in practice. Uh, you have to calculate C1, C2, Cn, right? Yes, yes. And, uh, and this is a challenge. That's why I, I'm asking you. It's like you can do that. You can write it down or not. Uh, I thought not because it would be corresponding to solve polaron problem in, uh, say, two-dimensional TJ model, which, which has not been you done. You cannot write it down. I, mean, I, have, yeah. I, haven't been, I haven't been clear. I, 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 it's, it's typical when you work on things for a long time, you think you're too fast to skip things. Um, it's not an exact solution. Yes, of course. Uh, it's not an exact yeah. solution. Yeah. So if you look at this, here is the wave function. Here's the eigenstate yeah. uh, of a given. You see the eigenstate you write as uh, a coefficient times just the whole and uh, uh, created on the antiferromagnetic background. Yeah. Then there's a next term is the whole, but then it also, there's also a spin wave. This is yeah. this term here. 
Yeah. And then the next term is the whole plus two spin waves yes. and so on. Yes, yes, yes. To yes. infinite order. Yes. And if you had to determine those exactly, you would have to uh, minimize the energy. You could you could take yep. in one hole, two holes, exactly. what has been done uh, you know many times in 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 in, in polar physics in. in but here we're doing something else. We are not doing a variational calculation. I have not oh, okay. been clear enough on this. You see, these are closed expressions. There's a this is a coefficient yes. in front of uh, the term with one spin wave and one hole. So this that. is a coefficient for this term. It's closed. You see, this is a term that enters in the Hamiltonian. This is this this is the, uh, this term here, mm. G, and uh, and. And this term here is a Green's function. Mm -hmm. So it's closed. It's a closed expression. Okay. It's, and this is an approximation, but this is the wave function that corresponds one mm -hmm. to one to the self to these kind of yeah. Yeah, di yeah, diagrams. Yeah. Uh, where are they? Here. I see. It's the approximation that corresponds to this. this so it's not an exact solution. It's not yeah, yeah, yeah. Condition. Because you want this uh, kind of closed expression, this is an ansatz, because otherwise it wouldn't be. Yeah. Absolutely, and this is why we can yeah. go to infinite order because this yeah. this uh, ansatz has a yeah, nice yeah. underlying recursion um, structure. So yeah. even if, when you, when you want to do dynamics, you can do it. I see. So if you say, okay, if I create a hole, it starts moving around, it starts creating spin waves. But if you only take into account a subset no. of those processes, mm -hmm. you get a closed expression for these higher order coefficients to infinite order. It's still mm -hmm. Pretty damn. Uh, I mean, it's very impressive. It's, it's what is. I didn't do it. It's Christian who did this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm. It's super impressive. He can do it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh -huh. yeah. But it's still. Uh -huh. It's not exact. But yeah, it's still I hard. I, I, I see your point. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, yeah, he's yeah. Really. Uh, yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's one of the of the kind of exact approximate ansatz, which when yeah. Okay. Exact yeah. approximate. We call it that. Yeah. Within this approximation, it's exact. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> question yeah uh, so um so there are processes that take you away from this form of the wave function right that destroy it and those processes have a certain time scale so i mean validity of this is a question of time scales there is a time scale on which the dynamics occurs and there is a time scale on which processes like collision integrals that take you away from this you know form of the wave function from this mm. time dependent uh, you know, mean field kind of ansatz. So, do you, you know, can you comment on that? Uh, I mean, did you look into those time scales? No, it, this is work in, in progress. So, we did not, uh, no, I cannot comment on why, whether there's some phase based arguments that, that, that uh, makes the time scale of these crossing terms longer. It's a good question. At but, the moment, it's something we're looking at. I mean, we, we, are, we are just looking at this method right now. But did you check it independently against something else, like some other you know, simulation or? Yes, yes, but there aren't many simulations. So this is well beyond, I mean, in high TC, they never worried about dynamics. Uh, and here, uh, let, me, let me maybe uh, show you some slides. I can tell you what kind of theories we can compare with. Uh, yeah, I wanted to also, since you, huh? yeah, yeah, maybe I'm also horribly run ahead. I, I just wanted to, to mention that, yeah, to my surprise, now I learned indeed that this non Gaussian exponent to the quadratic form work, works fine. At least this is a kind of interesting whether you, whether you checked against this. So, what, what, what people like, well, I should say name of Demler, but it was before him, but well, they wrote a lot of papers on that, uh, on this non Gaussian. Uh, kind of expon exponential form of ansatz, right? Which is also kind of exact approximate. Just, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I, okay, I, let me, let me, I mean, okay, so, so uh, that, that, that's a bunch of, okay, you are, you're jumping ahead. Uh, so, so maybe I just show it. Yeah, you, so, uh, uh, then, then just keep uh, this in mind let me just and say don't answer briefly. now. Let me just don't say don't answer briefly. now, maybe. Answer when you want. I just mentioned it. That's okay, now so, now so I shut down. These, and, you and see, you see these papers here? Um, are these papers? By yeah, Bruce, yeah, exactly, Bruce, exactly. Bruce. Yes, yes, it this was is about actually, it. Uh, this is uh, what's called a, a string model. Yeah. So they have this, uh, and uh, to, to be honest, uh, when I read these papers, I mean, you should ask them. I, it, it's, it's not comprehensible to me uh, precisely what they're doing in this string model. But I think 
uh, it's fair to say maybe there's some people from the group here who have to be careful, but it just doesn't model. I mean, it doesn't, you, it doesn't work very well when you compare with experiment. I think the string model, as far as I understand it, but you should ask uh, Eugene or Fabian, has a subset uh, of the method that we are using. At least it doesn't, when they compare with experiment, I'll show you, I will not show you their data, but I can tell you where they are. No, I, I, they brought me to this business. I also had like very recent paper with them on that. I didn't believe oh, cool. it works, but but yeah. it works. Uh, I was No, but this is not this is not the, the what you did with him. Uh, it's uh, it's not it's not the string model, right? You it's not the string. Else. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm yeah. just saying sometimes yeah. exponent works, sometimes not. Sometimes, I wanted yeah, I'm to not, know I'm, your I'm opinion. Not familiar. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I'm not familiar with. Maybe you should try it and see how it works. I mean, I'm I don't know. Familiar. I wanted your opinion as you do the anatomy. I know this is a new. Okay. This, is a new this is a new field to me. I mean, but I can tell you that. Any any method also just to brute force variation on this thing could be yeah. fun because I don't. Uh, they're basically at the moment, as far as I'm aware, it's us and it's uh, Eugene with Fabian Boost, and they do this string model, which is uh, yeah. It, it uh, you should just for yourself how well that works. But, but yeah. uh, we are not convinced. <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, <laughs> so let's just see what. I mean, okay, I have, now I've created a lot of enemies, but I mean. Let's just see what happens. Let's see what this method spits out. So uh -huh. here, uh, I am now, I have created a hole at r equals zero, here and here. And to the left, you see how this hole diffuses into a square lattice if it's a free hole. It's just a, it's just a hole, it's just a particle hopping freely, nothing around. To the right, you see if the hole hops in an antiferromagnetic background where it actually costs energy for it to hop because it creates frustration, Let's compare uh, what these two, what happens. And this, so the, 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 plot, the plot to the left is easy. This is so it's free graphic. for one lattice side, uh, jump on one uh, lattice side. This is just free, this. free, free. This is what you can ask a student in second year to do. This is what comes out of what Christian did with this heavy numerics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there you see how time goes by as it evolves. You see the whole diffuses out. I don't know how it works on Zoom, but you can see on the left that the free quantum walk hole moves out quicker than when it moves in a lattice, antiferromagnetic lattice, it's more confined, but it spreads out also mm -hmm. in the antiferromagnetic lattice. So this is what comes out of the numerics. So this basically see the whole density. Time is measured in hopping in T. Mm -hmm. So this is what, and this is very new. He just sent it to me last week. So I, I yeah, this is what comes out. And if we look at, if you now compare our, our uh, method to experiments. So uh, we are running out of time, but I only have nine minutes left. Um, Okay, but we have time for this. So uh, the yellow one is our theory. The dots here are experiment. And then the, I'll go through some of these other, I don't know, can, is this, uh, these other theories? Whoa. Um, so uh, you see that the yellow thing, our theory works reasonably well, but let's see what kind of theories uh, they throw. So in this paper, uh, they also have theorists on board. And they have uh, Fabian Gust and Eugene Dembler is here. So they don't use the, the, uh, the string theory model here, but they use something else. They use random walk, like a quantum walk, which is just free quantum walk, which is what you saw in the previous slide. Yeah. This is this dashed line. Then they use quantum walk on this uh, funny, so free walk again, free particle on a beta lattice, which is this curve here. Then they, it's our theory, it's yellow. And then they use DMRT which I think is available online or something you can download it. But that, unfortunately, the thing, that should be good, right? But this is on an 18 times four lattice so that you get finite size effects beyond one, essentially. Then you start getting waves uh, being reflected. And then they use zero temperature, infinite oh. temperature Monte Carlo. So essentially no magnetic order. So this is the theory, as far as we are aware, uh, that are being applied to analyze these experiments apart from this self-consistent bond, which is ours. So we think that ours is at least the one that makes the most honest attempt to actually model the physics that goes on apart from the GMRG. So GMRG is on isotropic lattice. So four, four lattice sites means that you just do two hopping and goodbye, you get the reflection. Yes, yes. Wow. I don't understand why they don't. Maybe oh, you guys wow. can- uh, Unbelievable, yeah. 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 So, uh, so, so, in, but all these theories work fairly well when you look at the whole population at the nearest neighbor side and the next nearest neighbor side. But then uh, let's go to long time because then all these theories fail. Uh, except, uh, so here you see the long time dynamics. You see the whole starts to slow down. Uh, the, 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 the dots are 
the experimental points and, and the lines are our theory. And it works reasonably well, especially for strong coupling. So strong coupling is the green dots and the green line. It actually is able to capture this crossover from initial just quantum walk. It doesn't feel the anti ferromagnetic order initially, and then it starts slowing down. And uh, this is something that we really like. We're looking into it right now. It seems to work pretty well. And here there is no other theory. If you look at the string model, the string model I think is down here because the string model is too, uh, as far as we understand it, but we should ask uh, Eugene and, and Fabian, it's too restrictive. Mm -hmm. and it, it basically forces the, it, 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 it confines the, because it doesn't have this uh, Heisenberg uh, relaxation of the magnetic order. So, um, so if you have, you can try with your Gaussian or you can do better DMRG. You can see how that works or variational. But <laughs> it, it, could, it could be, but this is not a variational. This is a self-consistent yeah. Yeah, 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 you already saw in is significant. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is how it looks. Uh, so we are looking at right now is we're trying to understand is this crossing over from quantum random walk? This is what comes out of the theory. The whole distance from the origin, it slows down to some constant velocity. And we think that, that initially you have free, free uh, diffusion, but then maybe at the end of the day, you are in some polaronic eigenstate. So this velocity here away from the origin, maybe it reflects uh, an average of the uh, group velocity of the whole over the whole beyond zone or something like this. But we think that this slowing down here is, is, is where the polaron, magnetic polaron has been formed. This is what we're looking at right now. And here we're looking at the, the velocity that you get as a function of coupling strength. This is our numerics. And this is the theory. There are only two points so far in the, in the data experiment. So that's what we're looking at now. So as I said, this is a work in progress. So um, I think actually we are on time. So, 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 so this is dynamical part of the problem. So I had a bunch of other stuff I wanted to show you, but there's only five minutes left. Uh, so I basically just want, these are the people who are involved in this project. It's Thomas Pohl and, and Miguel and Christian. Uh, and um, so I, I outlined to you this specific uh, approximation to describe magnetic polarons, which are holes moving around in an anti ferromagnetic lattice, creating magnetic disorder around them. And then I said that what our contribution has been to um, device a way to calculate the structure of the dressing cloud around the, the whole to infinite order, which is nice. So you can go to strong coupling and compare with experiments because that's what the experiments do. And our approximation very recent has also been to extend this approximation to look at the dynamical problem. And this is not, so if you wanna look at the static problems it's in this paper here and the dynamical stuff is something we are working on right now. So with this, uh, I'm done. I have some other slides, but we only have four minutes, three minutes left. So um, that's it. Okay, thank you. And I, since I keep this microphone, okay, promise one question. How did you get this uh, asymptotic solution, red uh, dashed line? Uh, just just a couple of words I, you know, on previous uh, slide. Uh, I mean, that's you, da, yeah, 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 this, how far? Uh, I actually, it's so new that I, I cannot uh, tell you apart from, he must have looked at, he must have looked at how does this basically taking the slope of these curves here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so it's just I, I, that's what that's what what he must have done. Uh, ah. But he just sent it to me. Uh, wow. And you so so it's yeah. it's very new. But that's that is what he must have done. Yeah. There's probably some noise in this curve. Let's see. Uh, it looks. Yeah. This this is what how he must have created these squares. I see. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a true workshop when we hear the, the news. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who want to ask questions? Okay, we have Vadim. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, fascinating stuff. Um, I was just wondering, as a sanity check for, for your approximation, uh, can you comment on the Nagaoka limit? of your lattice. So have you, have you, have you tried to investigate the Nagaoka limit and uh, whether you can recover the theorem 
Uh, uh, so what is the Nagoga theorem? It is that it's a paramagnet, right? In some limit. Well, this, uh, the statement, it? well, the, the theorem is that uh, in the Hubbard model with one hole in it, you uh, always have ferromagnetic ground state if the system size is finite. So for a finite system size, uh, it gets ferromagnetic for sufficiently large U. Uh, and, and in your case, I suppose that means for sufficiently weak, 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 coupling, weak, yeah. weak coupling. Yes, exactly. So that's that's the weak coupling limit. That's where oh. you... Uh, and no. and uh, well, in terms of your calculation, I think that would mean that if you calculate the correlation function that you, that you showed us uh, previously, uh, not, not exactly that one. If you calculate the correlation function between the, the position of the hole and polarization, I suppose you should have something like a, a huge ferromagnetic cloud surrounding your, your hole when you go to the weak coupling limit. And I, I was just wondering if you, if you are able to recover that result. That, that's an exact result. That, there are very yes. few exact results, but that's, that's yes. one is exact. So you, you, you probably should consider benchmarking your approximation. Yeah. Uh, I think to be honest that we cannot because uh, that, that goes all the way back to um, this, this, when you do this kind of stuff. Uh huh. Uh, unfortunately, let me put it. Oh, where is it? Um, when you do this mapping here, you are mapping around anti. You are expanding around anti ferromagnetic order. Very good. Yes, that that's so excellent. That's a, that's a, so we can't reach that ferromagnetic ground. State. Okay, that's but, actually a very good point. Uh, yeah, that, well, that's it's interesting whether yeah it's it it is it is interesting whether you can see signatures of the Nagaoka instability developing in the system in 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 this approximation. That would be interesting to see. I, yes, I guess. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you see some kind of instability, a breakdown, and you see that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh. Just a short question. Won't in the experiment, when any non coherent processes would reach, will give the same limit as what you call the polaron limit? Then it's simple uh, decoherence. And then you will see, I think, the same. The theory could be simpler. Uh, I don't understand. Because, because you start with a random, with a quantum walk, and then we have the other limit. I'm talking about the experiment. Yes. And this could be a, a, the, the, the decoherence or, or experiment. Uh, I'm saying that the slope could be, uh, the, 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 the experiment points could be not zero temperature limit and all this kind of. The oh. chain. So you say that if you did if you did a quantum walk at finite temperature, temperature, I think you would get the same thing because this, of course if you go to classical random walk you will get. I'm just asking. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you should probably ask the experimentalist. I mean, unfortunately, I mean the temperature here is uh, not negligible. Yeah. Uh, so the temperature, I think, is a half of J. I have to look it up. Yeah, I'm an experimentalist. <laughs> okay. Ah, okay. But not in this, not in this area. <laughs> okay. Uh, so there will be, but yeah. Yeah, you should, you should, uh, this, all what we're doing is zero temperature. So finite temperature is also on our shopping list. But that's, uh, we actually don't know right now how to do that from a, it's, it's, experimentally it's easy, but from a theory point of view, it's not so easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I understand. But all, all I'm saying is that then probably you will miss some higher orders and uh, it should, I think, lead to, some, to such similar behavior. But I don't know, I'm an mm. experimentalist in a different area. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a, a question. If you start from some excited state in the ground, I mean, some finite uh, magnetization state in the ground state around the polaron, it should it should help uh, via Nagaoka effect to for the polaron to move. So, do you know how this uh, work evolves if you increase the magnetization of the the, the ground state around? Uh, 
not, not the ground state, but then the state are. Uh, uh, what say again? I, I guess uh, I didn't get a. So, sorry, uh, here the ground state it's close to zero magnetization. You don't define magnetic state. If you start to to populate the ground state with some uh, spin wave, higher using a higher magnetization state, I guess it should help the the motion of polaron. So do, do you expect a transition from what you observe to more like a standard diffusive uh, quantum work? If you increase the magnetization in, in the you mean decrease the magnetization or oh, you increase because so, the, you start from zero magnetization state around the the holes the state is essentially ah, okay so you, you're not the magnetic or you want to you want to go towards okay so what is you want to do you want to start from a state where to put a bit of uh, ferromagnetic uh, say yes. uh, fluctuation in the in the surrounding state I don't know. I mean, that's a good idea. So you want instead of putting in the hole in the anti pair magnet, which is what we do here. But you start from here. a non s equal zero uh, state. Yes. Because what I remember is that in ladders we have seen that there is some uh, effective binding between some triplet states and the pairs of holes via Nag Nagaoka effect, basically. So 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 this should change the dynamic of the holes. Okay, uh, we have not looked at that, but it would, I mean, if you could send me some references on that, that would be fun. I mean, I don't know whether Christian can do that, but uh, that's an interesting, uh, yeah, we have not looked at this. As I said, it's, it's very new. Okay, thanks a lot. But if you can mail me some, something on that, that would be- because I, I we do. Had this, yeah, yeah. I do, thanks. Yeah. Online people? Uh, can I just ask a quick question here? Um, actually, I had two questions, but I don't know. It's getting a little bit late. So the first question is, um, you had comparison between your model or your theory, which is zero temperature, and the QMC at infinite temperature. And it didn't look very different on this figure here. So perhaps you could comment on that. Uh, yeah, so for this short, short time, uh, you see, all theories are pretty much, uh, I mean, you can argue which one works the best. I mean, it, basically, random walk is as good as uh, the other theories. And there's also this infinite, I don't know why they do infinite, yes, I probably shouldn't have put it up, but I don't know why they do this infinite quantum Monte Carlo, but all of them fail here. So all mm -hmm. these theories fail uh, for the long time dynamics. So I, I don't understand maybe some quantum Monte Carlo can can explain to me why they do infinite temperature quantum Monte Carlo. I don't know, but they all, as you can see, yes, but they they all here. It's hard to argue which one works the best. We think that uh, sure. because we are biased that our theory is the one that <laughs> is the most most honest uh, attempt to to model the problem, apart from DMRG. Uh, but the other ones work as well. You don't have to work so hard. You can just do a random walk or a quantum walk. But here they, they fail for the long time. Okay. And the uh, second question about your uh, expansion. So you had this expansion where in the you know, first order where you have one excitation, you have a Green's function. Should, should I understand that the next order is uh, like, can I understand them as two particle Green's functions or is it just- No, it's even, the C, it's, even simpler. It's, it's even simpler. It's the product, uh, mm -hmm. so it's even simpler. It's, it's uh, now, I don't know whether you can see yourself here. So maybe, so this, the, the second order will be, so this is the vertex in the Hamiltonian, then there's Green's function. And then the next mm -hmm. order will be vertex Green's function, vertex Green's function. It's not second order. Uh, it's not two particle Green's function. It's single particle okay. Green's function, all of it. And this is okay. what this, this uh, there are these rules here. So these thick lines are the single parts of Green's function. You can actually read off, this is set, this is the residue, the thin line is the residue. Uh, this red dot is the G in the, in the Hamiltonian and these thick lines are Green's functions. So from mm -hmm. these drawings, you can read off what are the coefficients in the wave function. Yeah, okay, cool, thanks. Azek online. 
Okay. If we don't have, I stop recording the first session. Uh, thank you very much, Geo. Stay with us.